everyone. Michael Shermer here. It's time for another episode of The Michael Shermer Show. This one is brought to you by Brilliant. Brilliant is the online learning platform that allows you to learn about interesting and important topics through a fun and interactive method by teaching that enables you or anyone to master almost anything, including me, <laughs> from basics to advanced. I'm still mostly on the basics myself uh, because, uh, you know, these kind of platforms uh, for a boomer like me uh, need to start easy. You just tap on the app like that. It opens right up. This one is on logic. I've never had a logic course. I know what it is, of course, but I need to really start at the basics. And going through these, it's amazing. Just in like 10 minutes, you can master so many really cool skills. I've been doing this on other subjects uh, uh, in science and and uh, philosophy and so on. If you want to check it out and support the podcast doing so, go to brilliant.org slash skeptic. You get a free 30-day trial, and the first 200 of you to do this get 20% off the annual uh, subscription for this. It's a great learning tool. I love online learning and different ways of um, being an autodidact, teaching yourself. It's never been easier, especially at brilliant.org. And if you go to brilliant.org slash skeptic, you get a free 30-day trial, and the first 200 of you get 20% off the annual subscription. Check it out. Thanks for supporting. Here's the podcast. My guest today is Leah Goldstein. Let me give you her little bio, because this is one of the most interesting, unusual uh, podcast episodes you're ever going to hear. Leah was conceived in Israel, born in Canada, and raised in Vancouver, British Columbia, by new immigrant parents. Her grandfather was the only one of his family that survived the German invasion. He fled to China, where he met and married his wife. Her grandmother survived two months in Auschwitz. Most little girls grow up desiring to be princesses or nurses. <laughs> I'm not sure that's the case anymore, but for this generation, yes, us baby boomers. But not Leah Goldstein. She knew she wanted to be Bruce Lee. Oh, my God. <laughs> that's such a great story. Growing up in Vancouver with new immigrant parents, Leah was bullied because of her accent and limp. Leah didn't run from her problems. She faced them when she attained the World Kickboxing Champion title at age 17. Her focus became not Bruce Lee, but James Bond, enlisting in the Israeli Defense Force and becoming the first female elite commando instructor. Leah faced many obstacles, battled bullies and sexism, and was ensured she would never make it because she was a woman. Leah transitioned into a special forces unit combating terrorism and violent crimes. She didn't just become an elite commando, she became a Krav Maga Specialist, M-A-G-A, but that has a different meaning than MAGA here in, in the United States. Specialist, that's a, an Israeli army self-defense training program to fight, to learn how to fight and kill with your bare hands. Okay, that's probably enough on the bio. I uh, hope I don't say anything wrong here. <laughs> uh, I did comment on Twitter about this because she's also the winner of the uh, Race Across America, which I co-founded in 1982 with three other men. And uh, she's done that several times, as well as doing other long-distance ultra-endurance sports. She has one coming up here in June, in which she's going to race across America. But this is in a different event in which you're self-contained. It's longer than RAM, and you have to carry all your own stuff. This is one tough person. Okay, why do I have her on the show? We're not going to geek out about cycling gear, so don't tune out. <laughs> she was invited to appear at this international women's event where she was to be the keynote speaker, International Women's Day event uh, sponsored by Inspire. And she was disinvited, cancel cultured. Why? Well, I can tell you it's not because she was a cyclist or a kickboxer. It's because she was in the Israeli army. Okay. Maybe that's a good place to start. Leah, how's that for an introduction? Welcome to the show. Yeah, that's pretty accurate. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> yeah, you are. You have quite the story. That's quite. Uh, I want. I want to spend a lot of time on your your background and yes. and because you know, I'm interested in how lives turn out, genes, environment, culture, willpower, and all that stuff. But first, tell us what happened with this event. You're invited to give the keynote address, and then. And then what, you got an email or a letter? No, I mean, basically in, in August, I was, uh, you know, we signed a contract. I was going to be the keynote speaker for International Women's Day in Petersboro, Ontario. Um, about four weeks ago, I received an email from the organizer saying there's been demonstrations um, 
for me, you know, for me not to come out that I, you know, then that if I do come, I should make a statement kind of condemning what's happening in the Middle East. And then she further goes on and says that if I don't, you know, make the statement or, or pull out, then their sponsors had threatened to pull out of the whole, you know, event. So that's basically what they left me with on a Saturday. And then before we could take a second breath, we got a second email on a Sunday that basically said, you know, the situation has gotten, you know, quite serious um, and we have to remove you. And that, that was it. And then she, in the next sentence is, do you have another speaker that we can replace Leia with? <laughs> That's it. <laughs> no. Unbelievable. Like, like cattle next, you know, it was a pretty well slap in the face to say the least. And did they, did they give the reason is because you were in the IDF? They said that there was protesting, um, there was a small group of people saying, you know, accusing Israel of the so-called genocide and that I'm part of an organization. And then they said I was part of the black op, some kind of secret, you know, undercover organization that's responsible for killing Palestinians. I mean, it was quite shocking that, you know, all these accusations and then and very one sided uh, to say the least. Right. You know, um, but that was basically it. And mind you, these emails weren't sent to me. They were sent to um, the speaking bureau, you know, that hire me. Um, and that was basically it, that I, they just let me go the second day and they made an announcement on their webpage saying because of the situation in the Middle East that I would be replaced. How long ago were you in the idea? <laughs> well, I'm 55, so about 33 years ago. <laughs> Unbelievable. So this is yeah. what's called um, uh, offense archaeology, where people go digging around in people's past. So they found something you did 33 years ago. Would this have happened uh, before October 7th of last year? Oh, I don't think so. Absolutely not. I mean, and also it's not to say that. I mean, the IDF is just an excuse. Even if I didn't serve in the IDF, they still would have fired me. I can guarantee you that. I mean, my question to them was, you know, if I was a Palestinian woman, you know, would be would I be allowed to, to present? Would I be also replaced, you know? And as a Jewish woman, I can tell you and your audience that I would not be offended to listen to a Palestinian woman talk about her life experiences and the stuff that she went through. You know, as long as we keep political you know, politics aside, I've been speaking for 11 years and not one time in those 11 years had anyone ever come up to me, anyone, you know, in my audience or the organization said that I had offended them in any which way, not to me, not to my organization or not to, you know, anonymously in 11 years. And now I'm being replaced, you know, so they're making something, you know, political that's not political. Right. So, again, this is all triggered by current events. Mm -hmm. A Women's Day uh, celebrating women's um, strength and autonomy and, and achievements of which you have a stellar list. And that gets erased. Yeah. I mean, the whole. Is it, and, 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 and is it because. So just let's just dig into this and see how far sure. we can go. Uh, reading other people's minds. Is it because you're Jewish? Is it because you, you were Israeli? Is it the IDF? Is it, do they even know what they're saying? Is it well, just I kind mean, of chanting? Nah, I don't know, well, Michael, why did they hire me in the first place? Not because I'm Jewish, not because I'm on the IDF, not because of, you know, I was a cyclist. Or they hired me because of what I speak about, motivation about life, about the stuff I went through, about winning, about losing, about hitting rock bottom, about near-death experiences. What does that have to do with politics or religion, which are the two subjects that I keep away from, because very sensitive, right? And this whole theme of the, you know, International Women's Day is, the, you know, a, a safe place for all women for, you know, diversity, for inclusion, except if you're Jewish, of course, you know, and also mm -hmm. what about other Jewish women that want to come to this event? Are they also going to be excluded? You know, so th th there's the big question right there to the organization that, which never contacted me personally. Mm. And the event I understand was canceled after all that. Yes. Yes. I mean, when the stir story first broke out, I mean, I didn't, honestly, I didn't think it would, it would have the impact that it has. It just exploded. I was on think 40 media outlets, including Fox news and the backlash that they were getting, I mean, the organizer took the whole website down and they said because of the, you know, the, I guess the fury and the anger from the public that they actually canceled the whole event. Amazing. Gosh, this is just amazing. Right. So you avoid politics and religion yes. <laughs> and it comes back to, to haunt you anyway. That's the, exactly. <laughs> I mean, that is a t testimony to our times. I was just reading this Atlantic uh, magazine um, cover story today on the, the sort of golden age of Jews in America is over, really mm -hmm. starting October 7th. Um, so I, I've been asking a lot of people, and I don't know what the answer is. You know, 
has anti-Semitism always been there beneath the surface and we only thought things were much better for Jews in the last half century? Or, uh, you you know, or is... (laughs) Yeah, what's going on here, do you think? I mean, I think it's always around. I don't think, you know, it's it's really going anywhere. I think this is just a good time for them kind of to rise up from underground, a good excuse to kind of to, to voice their anger and opinions and whatnot, right? But in all honesty, I mean, I've grown up in Canada, I mean, for most of my life, you know, and I've never experienced anything like this before. So, huh. I mean, like I said, it's a first, like, first I didn't even know how to handle it. I thought, what, is this a joke or something? But... You know, it's yeah, anti-Semitism is alive and well and kicking in Canada, unfortunately. Yeah, in Canada. I thought you guys were all uber liberal, uh, tol- in, tolerant and progressive there. That's what we all thought. <laughs> That's what I thought, you know, so it's, it is. It's, it's very disappointing. Yeah. Yeah. And again, you know, when these college kids are chanting from the river to the sea and then the, and, and then the host of these TV shows that follow them around with cameras, you know, what's the name of the river? Uh, I don't know. You know, what sea is that? Uh, I don't know. Exactly. Uh, you know, I do wonder, are they just virtue signaling or they're just going along with the crowd because, you know, let's just go out there and do something and they don't even know what they're saying. Or do they think, yeah, I really don't like Jews, right? I really don't like Israelis. I mean, I think we're, sh- like, I think a lot of people are sheep. We just like to follow. And you know what I mean? I just, I just wish half the people knew what they were actually protesting, which I probably they probably don't, right? You know, um, mm-hmm. which is an unfortunate thing. Like, like know know the education, know what you're standing there for, right? But yeah, it's just a sad state to say the least. I mean, it's uh, very unfortunate that what's happening right now all over the world, not just in Canada. Right, and if you're Israeli, you ha- uh, you have to serve in the military, right? Isn't it a requirement? Right. Yes, yeah. Women do two years, and men do three years. Yeah, right. So why wasn't just serving in the military enough for you? You wanted to be a commando and, and do all this extra stuff. What, what was oh, the yeah, motive? Oh, yeah, no, I wanted to work <laughs> for intelligence. I mean, since I was seven years old, right? You know what I mean? So I had... Why? What, what, it was already a long time ago. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Yeah, okay. Well, let's talk about that. What What's the impetus for that? Um, well, you know, we... My parents immigrated to Canada, like I said, I was I was made in Israel, born in Canada. Um, but we went back to Israel every year because all my family is there. And I just had a connection to the country. And then I said that I wanted to, I wanted to work for some intelligence agency when I was, you know, when I would be of age after high school and that, and you'd think as a seven year old, that that dream kind of would diminish as you get old, got got older, but it just intensified as I got older. So that was my mission. Yeah. Uh, Let me note parenthetically that, and I assume you would agree, there is room for criticism of Israeli government activities and decisions, just like there is of any country. And that's separate from, you know, the kind of things that are being said about Jews and I- Israelis now. Uh, mm-hmm. That is to say, you know, there's uh, reasonable disputes to be made over the West Bank or, or this territory or that or this action or that action, like you could of any country. Mm-hmm. Well, I mean, like I said, I, I don't really might get into the politics yeah. of it, right? Yeah. I mean, it's a terrible situation what's happening, you know what I mean? But, you know, Israel is a small country and it has the right to defend itself. So we can't forget about October 7th, you know, when we talk about what's happening at the state. But you know what? I question, too, if it was in another country, would they still get this backlash? You know, but I think because it is Israel, there's even a harsher criticism because of the country in itself. Right. So, you know, it's like I said, what, what, what can you say as a Jew? It's really hard to see this hatred and this violence and just people kind of making noise and they don't even know what they're talking about, which is also really mm-hmm. frustrating. Mm-hmm. It's the only Jewish state in the world. Muslims have dozens of, of, of nations they can uh, belong to. Yeah, it's just uh, bizarre. I do think there's a, a, an element of ancient anti-Semitism, uh, which is a different kind of bigotry and race or, or, or prejudice than other forms, in as much as you know, most forms of bigotry look down upon people, but the Jews are not just, they're not looked down upon. They're looked at like they're, they're extra nefariously smart. They're smart, but they're nefariously smart, right? They're manipulatively. Look, they go into banking and Hollywood and the media and all this, you know, neglecting the fact that Jews were excluded from most professions throughout history, uh, say, just say since the early modern period. So they had no choice but to go into certain professions where they were not blocked. I'm going to, and then, you know, it becomes something of a self, self-fulfilling prophecy in that way, you know, just sort of p- punctuating that point. Yeah. Okay. So, um, yeah, that's just, what do you think will happen now, uh, as a result of this, um, 
to to you? Do you think uh, other invitations will dry up or? Well, I mean, honestly, we've we I've had so many requests since this story has come out. I oh, mean, we're almost okay. overbooked. So, you know, for me personally, oh, maybe it's, it'll have the opposite effect. You know, so, <laughs> thank you, Heather. <laughs> Whatever. <laughs> but um, yeah, no. I mean, I'm still getting very positive messages. I mean, of course, we I'm getting a lot of not so nice messages from hate mail, but that's you know expected. But for the most part, honestly, about eighty percent of the messages coming in when they when when the story broke. We're very positive and people showing their anger and not just from the Jewish community, you know, from everybody, men, women saying that this is not right. And so it's very, you know, heartbreaking and very emotional for me to get such positive messages. Oh, nice. Nice. Yeah. So this could be like a Streisand effect or or abandoned Boston effect. Right. <laughs> <laughs> yes. If only people would ban one of my books, darn it. <laughs> right. <laughs> right. Exactly. And everybody wants it. Yeah. Okay, so, you know, I'm really interested and may write a book about this someday on how lives turn out, you know, genes, environment, you know, biology and genes, environment, home and, and, and so culture and so forth. And then luck, just contingency, just the way right. things happen to go. Mm -hmm. All right. So you are a highly unusual person. First of all, you clearly have high need of achievement and motivation. You are driven to succeed. Where does that come from? Um, I'm going to say probably from my parents, you know, my parents are really hard workers um, and very, you know, very supportive. And, you know, I mean, I hit saw my, you know, my, my parents basically came to Canada. I was in the oven. My sister was three years old and, you know, my dad had a hundred bucks and we knew nobody. Mm. And, you know, him just, just determined to make a life for himself, you know, in this country. And he worked his butt off. And at one point, he, you know, he made lots of money. We had lots of houses and we lost everything, hitting rock bottom again. You know, my dad says, no, we start over again. And he builds, his, you know, back up and and he's very successful to this day. Right. So I saw hardworking parents, very positive parents saying it doesn't matter what happens. You always work your butt off. So I think growing up in that kind of environment, it kind of instills in you that there's nothing you can't do when you put your mind to it. Yeah. There's a lot of research in behavior genetics with twins you know, uh, raised in the same environment, twins separated birth, raised in different environments, siblings in the same environment, siblings in different environments, and so on. So you kind of do a something like a comparative method with the controlled um, variables there. It looks like most things are at least half heritable. That is to say, half of the variance between people is accounted for by their genes, not just intelligence and height and things like that, but but um, like happiness or just, you know, temperament. And, and a lot of the personality dimensions, like openness to experience, conscientiousness, you would be very high in conscientiousness. That, that is goal setting, achieving yes. goals, things like that. You know, lining up your ducks every day and knocking them down. Boom, boom, boom. Here's the right. 12 things I'm going to do today. And I'm going to drive until I get those, right? But, you know, a lot of people don't have that. They're just born. They don't feel that way when they get up in the morning. Some people do. Some people don't. <laughs> you know, so to what extent can... Can you, can we take credit for that? I mean, I consider that almost a form of luck. You know, I'm lucky that I feel driven to succeed. It didn't have to be that way. I, I mean, I, I think personally for me, I think it's people kind of, you know, feeling uncomfortable getting out of their comfort zone, right? You know, or the, uh, the fear of failure. I mean, failure is part of success. I mean, you know, you don't, you know, with all the successful people in the world, athletes and businessmen, artists, whatever it may be, you know, you don't hear the backstory. You hear, okay, now they're successful, but what did it take for them to get there? And I think people have to share that more. And they, they don't care about, you know, the races that you won or the gold medals that you won or this, you know, how much money you've made is where did you start from when you start from nothing and you build your way up and how many times you've fallen, but you got back up. And I think that's where the interesting part, you know, hits and most people can resonate at that point, you know, or, or in my case too, I mean, you know, near death experience in 2006, landing at, you know, 80 kilometers an hour on my face and saying that I'd never race again. I'd never walk again properly. You know, and they don't know that I'd reconstructed surgery on my face and I was in a wheelchair for God knows how long, you know, and coming out of that and then becoming, you know, one of the best cyclists in the world. So that's the interesting part. That's what people want to hear. It's not all the stuff up here. You know, they that's fantasy for them. And I think that's that's where the, you know, with the motivation of kind of coming out of your comfort zone will resonate with more people when they hear the real backstory. And, you know, it's okay to fail. But the thing is, though, life is short and we can't sit here and wait for something that will never happen. Right. You know, because before you know it, you're going to be sitting on your deathbed. And, and my grandmother had the biggest impact, you know, when she was dying of cancer, 
the last words she saw, you know, she said to me before she actually passed away, she said to me, you, you know, pointing her bony finger is that you never want to be on your deathbed saying the words I wish or what if. And those words stuck with me hard. <laughs> Great. <laughs> yeah, I like that. Well, okay. So your parents, your grandmother, mm-hmm. um, were there mentors or teachers or coaches or anybody that really helped drive you or inspire you or guide you? Um, yeah, I mean, there was like Sarah Neal, who's a big Olympian. She was one of my coaches. Roger Neal was another one of my coaches. Um, my kickboxing coach was huge. Like, you know, it was really Alan Chang. Yeah, they were really good mentors and and just good people, you know, um, just really positive and, and taught me the, the good things in life, right? You know, that it's okay to fail. That means you just have to work a little bit harder. You know? <laughs> so, yeah, so there there were many on the way for sure. But I mean, I, what I'm asking is, like, if you gave advice to somebody who says, I want to do what you did, what do I do? Well, one thing would be meet somebody that's doing what you want to do and then befriend them or ask them to help or you know, ask them to coach you or something like that. Well, I think I think that's a small part, because the thing is, when you say you want to do something is how badly do you really want to do it? Right. You know, like, are you willing to sacrifice a lot of what you're doing right now in order to focus in? Because I know, for example, when I was 17 years old or prior to winning the world championships, that, you know, good times, friends and whatever parties, they weren't going to happen for me to be the best in the world. You know, I had to laser in on the training. I did correspondence. I trained three times a week. At the age of 17, I was the undefeated champion of the world. And I learned at that age, what does it take, right? You know, are you willing to do that? So it has to come from you. No one's going to make you do it, right? Make Not make you do you. it, but but how did you know what to do? Like, how, how do you train three days a week or how much sleep or what do you eat? Somebody must have given you some guidance. Well, I mean, well it depends what where, where we're talking about, right? I mean, for, for that kind of, to help you get there, right? But I'm talking about the sacrifice and the motivation for you of how badly you want it, right? You know, I mean, listen, when I went into pro cycling, I left the Middle East to become a professional cyclist at age 30. And I, I lost everything. I mean, I, 38 years it took me before I finally reached this point of cycling where I could say, yes, I'm finally this professional cyclist. But it took me eight long years of embarrassment, of losing, of almost dying to get to that point because I refused to give up. So again, it's the question is, how much are you willing to sacrifice to get to where you want to get to? And then there's the role of, I guess, role models or heroes. So Bruce Lee, tell me about that. I mean, he's he's such a giant figure in, in our imagination. And there's nothing better than watching Bruce Lee videos on YouTube now. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's funny how the Bruce Lee, well, I was bullied in, in elementary school. Like every lunch hour between like 12 and 12.45, me and my best friend, Matthew, we would be chased by a group of eight boys, right? You know, so, the, and I didn't want to tell my parents because, you know, they were really struggling as it was. So I came home one day after school and I was flipping through the channels, was looking for Gilligan's Island just to show that I really was allowed. I was allowed one hour of TV, then we had to go outside till it got dark, right? So as I'm flipping through the channel, I see the skinny Asian man fighting 5, 10, 15 people. And I get really excited. Oh, damn, he can fight off 30. I only have to fight off eight. So I begged my mom for this. You know, he was doing Kung Fu. So I begged my mom for lessons and she enrolled me in a, in a Korean form of self-defense called Taekwondo. Okay. And you did that. What was that like? That was good. Well, I was a second degree black belt by 12 years old. And then a kickboxing coach saw me and said, you know, think you'd be a better kickboxer than, you know, the more of a traditional form of uh, Taekwondo. So that's how the transition started. I started training with Alan Chang in Vancouver. And then he said to me, you train hard, you listen to me and go 17 years old. Remember at this point, I'm barely 13. I make you world champion. And then I said, I'm in. <laughs> and, and at 17 years old, I was the world champion. That's amazing. For those of us that don't know too much about this, what's the difference between kickboxing and Taekwondo and whatever else? Yeah. in that category. Take, well, to kick, kickboxing is kind of a, a form of martial arts with boxing, just combine the two, right? You know, um, and then and then Taekwondo is just a Korean form of self-defense, like karate or judo or jiu-jitsu. Yeah. Yeah, didn't, there's some Bruce Lee video where he's talking about water. You want to be like water. <laughs> Do you remember that? What is, what, what's he talking it's about there? It's more the fluidity of water, right? Oh. You know what I mean? That you can make yourself almost into anything and same with, you know, kind of more of the impact of, things coming at you really fast and be able to move and to be smooth. So that's what he's talking about. I think the movement of being flow and fluidity like water. Okay. So you're world kickboxing champion at age 17. That's pretty young. What do you do after that? I'm, I'm <laughs> immigrating to Israel. I joined the IDF. Right. Okay. <laughs> right. You have to be 18, I presume, to do that. 
Well, after high school, yes, correct. Yeah, and so how many years did you do that? I, well, I did a special program. I did an intense IDF program where they kind of recruited about 300 of us. They cut us in half, they cut us in half. And then I was positioned in a base called Base 8, where I trained elite units such as the command of the first woman training those elite units. Um, and I did different operations with the military. And then I transitioned into the another kind of government program. And I worked for the Belush, which is a spying agency, for about almost nine years. Wow. Okay, so in, in the basic training, you must have had a head start. I mean, most people join these things are pretty out of shape. <laughs> Kids these days, maybe not back then, but you were obviously super fit. So that must have been fun for you. Is like This is like training. Well, it was it was intense. I think it was a lot of mental training. You know, like uh, just a quick example, like they would get us up at, you know, 11, 11 p.m. And then we go on this hiking truck for 30 kilometers. We come back to the barracks and they said, OK, you can rest for three hours. And then not not even 30 seconds pass. They turn the lights back on, came back out again. So it's kind of these mind games, you know, to see what it takes to crack you. So I knew that in the military, if anything was too good to be true, that it's too good to be true. <laughs> That's what you have to remember, right? <laughs> and is the idea there that they're toughening you up or they're eliminating those who are not already tough and whoever's They're, left standing, well, those are the people we want. Good question. It's a selection process, right? They Once they see kind of your reaction, how you handle things, they'll start moving things around a little bit, right? But mind you, I mean, even prior to the military, I mean, they know quite a bit about you, you know, coming in and you have, kind of with your background and and the testing you do even before the military, right? So I was part of a training unit where we were going to be training elite soldiers. Um, again, it's called uh, Kurs Madasim, you know? So it's a very selected few of um, soldiers that go through this course. And what are some of the projects or tasks or missions you that you did that you can tell us about? Well, I mean, we train, like you were talking about Krav Maga. So Krav Maga is a Hebrew word. Krav means fight, Maga means hand. So lethal hand combat. I mean, so we teach soldiers, let's just say if their ammunition jams, how to use a rock, a stick, a stone in the most lethal way. And um, we do scenarios where we, you know, jump soldiers and see how they kind of react or if they're being choked or what whatnot, right? So it was more survival for the soldier that I was involved with. Um, and then training elite units in different places in the Middle East. And did you do that? I mean, not just train people, but actually go out into the field and experience these scenarios? Yes, that was part of my, yes, I was part of that unit. Can you tell it? What can you tell us? <laughs> um, well, you know, I was, it was kind of secretive. I mean, I, would be, I wouldn't be told where I was going. They basically put me on a bus, send me to a location in Israel. I'd get a troop of whatever, you know, of um, a unit, you know, I wouldn't even, basically in Israel, you don't ask questions, you just do it, right? And we would put them through an intense training, you know, what they would have to go through, um, long treks of 100, 200 kilometers. It's it's insane what you put these commandos through. And and you talk about sleep deprivation, the most elite, you, you know, in most elite athletes, it's the commando. There's no question, not the skiers, not the race across America, whatever. It's, it's the people that can go through this because it's insanely difficult, both physically and mentally. Wow. Okay. What's the worst day you ever had doing that? Um, I think it is when you see, to go through this course, right, you have to go through an intense two-year program. And some of those soldiers crack 24 hours before they graduate. Can you imagine? Oh. Can you imagine that? And that, for me, is gut-wrenching when you have to experience people go through that. 24 hours before they can say, okay, yes, you are going whatever department unit you're going to, and they're removed. So, I mean, there was a problem actually with soldiers like, you know, almost committing suicide and going through depression and mental problems because of that. So I think the protocol has changed. Mind you, this is a long time ago, right? So I don't know how it works now, but like I said, it was it was very difficult to see that, even as an instructor, because you want them to succeed. You see how hard they try and, and how badly they want this, right? And for them, you know, at a very young age, it's their life. I mean, for them, it's, it's, it's that or nothing. Were you ever in a scenario where you had to fight somebody hand to hand? I did, yes. Well, not yeah, that, yeah, a couple of times. <laughs> you did, yeah. Can you tell us about it? Um, well, or are you was, not allowed I to? Lived, um, I lived in a in a moshav, which is like a little village, you know. Um, and I, as an instructor, we had to be incredibly fit, you know. That was 
it was it was very important because I have to do what the soldiers are doing. I don't just stand there with a the clipboard. You know, you're going through this trek. So I went for a, a run and I, of course, I'm fully armed, you know, when I, I just, it's just part of the protocol. And I was running and there was, there was three, I'm going to say young men, whatever, kind of walking the opposite way. And I was running and they tried to block, you know, to block me. Um, so I ended up just, I don't know if I, I kicked one in the nuts, whatever. I pulled out my gun and I said, really, I'm going to live. <laughs> and you that's did? It. Yeah. And they left? They left. <laughs> don't fuck with this one. Because <laughs> <laughs> you're yeah. not big, right? Aren't you? You're, aren't you? No, I'm short? five. I, well, at that time I was even smaller, but now I was five, six, like 125 pounds. <laughs> <laughs> wow. But solid muscle. <laughs> well, I mean, it's like Kamala is based on skill opposed to strength, right? I mean, there's certain areas in the body that you can't train. I don't care how big you are, right? You know, so you know what to strike. And also, um, I think, too, I mean, just being aware of your background, you know, and where you are and I mean, kind of things like that, right? So, yeah. But I wasn't at that. I mean, see, back then I was a lot tougher than I am now. <laughs> <laughs> You're like a honey badger. Have you ever seen those videos of honey badgers where there's like three or four lions or or hyenas trying to take it down and ends up just destroying all of them and they run away. Oh, really? <laughs> it's amazing. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, super intense. Yeah, just look up Honey ba Badger yeah. Fight on YouTube and there's just great yeah. videos on there. Yeah. Yeah, okay. So you're in the IDF and the commandos and all that stuff. Just as a point of, uh, of clarification, how is this different from Mossad? What is Mossad and how is it different what you guys were doing? Well, that's military. Um, when I transitioned, I worked for the Belouche, which was internal um, spying agency was Mossad is mostly external, like outside of the country. Oh, I see. Sort of like the difference between the CIA and the FBI, I guess. Correct. External versus internal security and so forth, intelligence. Yeah. And, you know, kind of looking at the bigger picture, I, I, I imagine a lot of this is driven by the never again mantra post-World War II. We're not going to ever let this happen again. And now we have our own country. I think this does inform a lot of what's going on now. You know, after October 7th, you just, we cannot let anybody ever do this again. It just can't, you can't stand up for it. We have to stand well, exactly. up against it. Yeah. That's funny. I was just talking to my cousin, Dina Goldstein, about it today. There was a women's march in Vancouver and there was one kind of pro-Israel and the other one was a pro-Palestinian and they were praising two known female terrorists there. You know, they're, they don't hide it, whatever. And so... Um, but the nice thing was, there's only like 15 people in that, <laughs> whatever, but you know, they exclude me, but yet they let this, whatever too, you know, Palestinian terrorists, whatever, go and talk bad about Israel or whatever. And just, just hate and violence and just promoting that it's just insane. But and actually the RCMP did, did come in, but I think, like you said, um, it won't happen again because we're too strong right now. There's no way. And Israel has to show that it is a heavy hand that if you do come and invade, then you will pay the big price. And that's exactly what they're doing. Yeah. All right. So you're in the, uh, you did that for what, seven years? Uh, yeah. Years I came something? back to Kenda when I was 30. So I was there. For, and you decide, okay, now what am I going to do? Years. Yeah. <laughs> How do no, I top I, this? <laughs> at the Kind of at the end of my um, working for the Belouche for so many years, I, I just wanted to become a professional cyclist. I, I was introduced to duathlons by another Lieutenant from the commando there. He saw that I was always training myself. So he said, you know, and he saw that I commuted to the base on my bike because on a military salary, you have no money for a car. You know, I had a car, but it would just sit in the parking lot. So he just invited me on this ride. And, and I was, you know, kind of surprised at how pretty good I was for having this piece of junk, an old tank of a bike. And he got me into to do athlons. And then I started winning them. And it was mostly not because of the running, but because of the riding. And I started to fall in love with the sport. So I just said, you know what, I think... I was kind of naive, a little bit, you know, delusional that I wanted to become a professional cyclist. But, uh, but what year was this? Oh, my gosh. Uh, in the 90s. Now, and, and did you know you wanted to go, go into long distance cycling or are you just interested in road? Oh, no, no. I wanted anything. to do yeah, the pro circuit. Like, kind of race, like the Tour de France. I wanted to mm -hmm. ride, ride the pro circuit for a pro okay. circuit. That All was right. my goal. Okay. Yeah. And so how did you do that in Canada? Were there teams you joined? Yeah, well, yeah, I rode with the national team for five years, the Canadian national team. We were stationed in France, so I, I did the Tour de L'Eau, um, the equivalent of the Tour de France uh, of for men. It's called the, um, the Grand Bucal, which is for women. So I was a, a domestique in there. I mean, I won national championships. So as a pro racer, I did I did pretty good. I went to Tour of Gila, the big stage race there. And then at the end of my cycling career, kind of when I was like 39, 40, 
I saw Race Across America. I remember seeing Race Across America well before that. I thought, wow, that's fascinating. And then I realized that in pro racing, I got better the longer the race, right? You know, um, I got stronger and I thought, you know what? I'm more of an ultra endurance rider than I am, you know, one for these shorter distances. Mm. Is that because of age or are there other physiological differences? Like, I don't know, fast twitch versus slow twitch muscle fiber or VO2 uptake or I don't know what. I don't know. I mean, I can tell you too, like the whole sleep deprivation, because as you know, in long distance racing, you have to be right. able to to function for possibly 40 hours without sleep. I mean, I had that training in the military. So that's down pat, right? <laughs> you know, the cycling, as I said, I think my rate of recovery is really fast too. Again, in stage races, I was I would get stronger as the race progressed, especially the last three days, opposed to the beginner, the, the beginning, right? You know, so I just think I was more designed and built. Like I do probably have more of the slower twitch muscles. Um, but the ultra endurance stuff for sure and then the sleep deprivation is another big bonus right and also being able to push myself beyond my limits right is a huge you know three main factors for successful ultra endurance racing okay so what happened with this crash that was in 2000 and well there's multiple crashes but 2006 the big one, the, big <laughs> one the mother of all crashes well i mean it was so big that even Velo news said it was one of the worst crashes in the history of the sport minus people who died I was at um, a race in Bend, Oregon called Cascade Classic, and we were descending. Um, and then, you know, as you know, in those bikes, we can go up to like 100 kilometers an hour very fast. We're at 65 miles. And as we were descending, there was a rider kind of on my left side. You know, there's a penalty if you touch the center line, you know, that you get a time penalty. And she was really kind of hugging that line when she kind of lost control of her bike. She leaned into me and at about 75, 80 kilometers an hour, I end up landing on my face. And it was, oh, I'm going to say that I thought I was going to, I just felt everything rip up every, I think I broke every bone. My skin was completely ripped off. You know, I was in the trauma unit in Bend, Oregon for about four weeks. Yeah, it was not good. Diagnosis was not good. They said, questionable about your ability to walk properly without a walker or a cane. And for sure, you'll never race again. That's basically what I was told when I opened up my eyes <laughs> out of surgery. Now, yeah. Was this before everyone was mandated to wear helmets uh no no we had to wear helmets yeah you no, had no. your helmet on. yeah we oh, yeah, had definitely well, you'd probably yeah you'd probably be dead without a helmet oh i wouldn't be so you know, definitely i'd be dead probably nine times yeah. yeah no definitely yeah i like that little meme that that cyclists tell of the people that don't know what it's like to crash on a bike is like get in your car get up to like 30 40 miles an hour wearing like lycra uh, workout clothes and uh, unbuckle your seatbelt, and then throw yourself out on the pavement <laughs> totally. Totally. I mean, it's not good. Yeah. yeah. And then in 2010, I don't know if you know too. I mean, I was also in a in a stage race in Redlands, California. I was warming up, you know, for a criterium. It's just a short circuit race. And I was coming back to the team car and this black Hyundai was coming at me at about 80 kilometers an hour, 50 miles an hour. And she ended up hitting me from the rear of the bike, which ejected me to the other side of the road. I stuck both my arms out and I had two compound fractures. Oh. That was four years after that. <laughs> So, I've had my fair share of you know kissing. No, I, didn't, I, I didn't. I didn't. I didn't see that in your yeah. in your bio materials. Okay, another big. Yeah. Well, that's. Uh, I know. I worry about this all with when I'm riding out on the open right? roads. It could yeah. happen to anybody. I know. You just never and this know. was in a closed space too. Like there was barricades and whatnot. What but she's trying to race to get out of there, and uh, so she ends up you know slamming uh, into me. I mean, the impact was so loud. People three blocks down the road could hear it. Oh my god! Wow. Yeah. That's amazing. You're still going. And that's only the start. Then you went transition from road racing and crits to uh, ultra marathon cycling. So tell me about that. Yes. I, um, I just did my first, I think it was Furnace Creek, I believe it was uh -huh. 500 mile or 800 K. And yeah, I, I fell in love with it. I, it was that the funny thing, the first race that I did, it was the worst wind conditions that race ever had. I mean, I kid you not, I see scorpions flying around. There was winds like 150 kilometers an hour. People were walking their bikes and I loved it. It was so much fun. I ended up winning the race. I did it in 35 hours and, and that's it. It was, that was the start of my ultra endurance career. Yeah. So, so to listeners, this is, Furnace Creek is out in the desert, basically Correct. the Mojave desert yes. north of Los Angeles. And it is barren. It is dry. It is hot. Yeah. It's a, that's a, that's a tough one. Yeah. I never did that one solo. I did it as a team. Let's see, on the, uh, I think it was the 30th anniversary Ram. Was that right? 20, yeah, I think so. Anyway, it was John Howard, Lon Haldeman, John Marino, and me as a team, relay team. Okay. Uh, the first, the first four riders in, in the Great American Bike Race. Yeah. So 
but but even just riding a quarter of it yeah. <laughs> was pretty difficult. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> you know, being I, out I, in the I, open I, desert, it's that's the that's the hard desert riding. Is coming from Israel, and I I thrive in the heat. I really like the heat. I'm not great in the cold. God knows why I live in Canada, but um, yeah, oh. that was it was a good it was a good race. It was a good start for me. Okay, so did you know Shauna Hogan uh, and some of the women in Ram? I didn't really know so much about them. I mean, I learned, obviously, as I got more into the sport, as the years, people were telling me, like, you know, Shanna Hogan is like the the godmother of, of the whole ultra endurance world, right? So I met her for the first time on my first race across America, which was in 2011. She kind of um, was the lead out, you know, she was kind of the guest of honor there. And the first words she said to me, the only words she said to me was, just stay on your bike. <laughs> she said to me, stay on your bike. Yeah. Yeah, the 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 reason that's important for people don't know is, let's say you ride a hundred miles and you're like five miles ahead of the person behind you, and you're like, "Well, I just did good. I'm just going to go in the motor home and just you know take a pee break and maybe just get a little massage." And then you fiddle around; and it's fifteen minutes, twenty uh -huh. minutes, and then that five mile gap is gone. Yeah, and 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 you didn't even sleep. You just were kind of futzing around in the motorhome, right? Yeah. <laughs> Absolutely. That oh, happens yeah. a lot. I mean, everything. I mean, anything you can do on the bike, eat, eating, brushing your teeth, whatever it may be, you know what I mean? I mean? You can change your shirt or whatever. You have that kind of skill. Is It's super important. It's like you said, even two, three minutes, try and make that up, right? And when you talk about five miles, I mean, even in Race Across America, when somebody's 100 kilometers behind me, that's still pretty close. Because with a good tailwind, I mean, that's three hours you can catch that person, maybe less. So in races like that, I mean, it's you're always you always have to be on your toes. So you did it first in 2011. What was your time that first time? I did it in 11 days, four hours, I think that was. 11 days, four okay. hours. All right. Yeah. And then w what was your second time? When did you do it? Well, after that, you know, I had raced for 12 years. I said, I'm I'm breaking. I mean, I, I did race across America. I won it. I decided to retire. Oh, okay. And then when I turned 50, I said, I'm coming back into the sport. You know, there was <laughs> something. I said, oh, I got to do it again. I think I can be a little bit faster. And I actually was, I did it in 10 days and 17 hours, I think. And the course was a little bit longer. So, and that was at 51. And then, and then 2021, I think I was the first woman to actually win the overall. And right. that was when that huge hit, um, heat wave hit the whole, the whole world, basically. Right. That was, uh, 2021 was, that was. Yeah. You, 2021, I think. You won the whole, you won the whole thing. Yeah. yeah. And ten that was your ten days, eight hours, right? I no, think we, that no. was actually I don't I don't know if you remember, like in, in the heat was so intense. You know that there's only three racers that finished that ride, right? I mean, the, the heat in the desert. I think I I hit on my uh you know on my Garmin. It said fifty three Celsius, which is I don't know one hundred and thirty Fahrenheit or something yeah, like that. It was yeah. un unbelievably hot. Like it was. I mean. I had burned right through my jersey. That's the intensity of the heat. You know, you, I couldn't even touch the cockpit of the bike without dousing it. And the one of this, I think it was a, the guy from Denmark, his cockpit, the Garmin, actually started melting. That's how incredibly hot it was, right? And, you know, so I had to be, multiple times I had to get IV because, you know, you just couldn't stay hydrated. I couldn't touch the nipple of the bottle. And it wasn't just through the desert. Even in Kansas, it hit like 120 Fahrenheit. It was insane. Colorado, 100 in Colorado, climbing Wolf Creek Pass. I was taking my clothes off, supposed to bring it. It was in that year was absolutely insane. So it wasn't a, a, a super fast finish, but I'll take it. It was 11 days and two hours, I think it was, or one hour, something like that. And there was, a, yeah, I forgot about that. It was a total, how many total finishers? There's three. I came There's in 11 three. days, 17 hours after me came in the first man. And then the last rider came in about an hour and a half after him. And that was it. And oh most, I think three quarters of the teams, even more than that, had pulled out. Wow. Teams. <laughs> That's, right. Yeah, really it teams. Was, yeah. It was, it was unbelievably hot. Yeah. I mean, I would douse myself with water and I'd be dry within like three minutes. Yeah. Yeah. And that 82 race, I sent you the write up in the video, uh, from uh, Wide World of Sports, they showed me getting buckets of water from yeah. my crew thrown on me out in the yes. Palm Springs. Yeah, yeah, uh, yeah. Uh, okay, right. So, and then you got Shermer neck, right? Yeah, I got Shermer's like in 2011. I um, I was like, my I was flying the first few days. Like, oh, I'm gonna be Shauna Records, <laughs> whatever. And then I got this incredible pain, and I was having a hard time holding my head up. And you know, Shermer's like, when the onset, it just bang, it happens, right? And then three hours later, 
my head is completely dropped. I cannot lift my head up. You know, this is three days into the race. And so, you know, my crew saying we have to pull out. I go, I don't know. I don't care if I have to crawl across the country. I've never, you know, quit a race in my life. So they're coming up with all these apparatuses trying to hold my head up. So the apparatus that we still use to this day was they basically shaved me from year to year because I got quite a bit of long hair. Um, with the <laughs> remainder of hair that was on top of my head, they'd, they'd take tensor bandage, they'd French braid it into three spots, they'd pull my head back, my hair back, you know, um, and tie it to the back of my heart rate monitor. So my head was kind of dangling, kind of like a bobble <laughs> head. <laughs> I finished the race. The first that, that was the first race across America. Wow. A very smart, very creative crew. <laughs> <laughs> By the way, did you know the origin of the name of that neck problem, that malady? I think you the honors, is that correct? <laughs> <laughs> That's correct. Yeah. Yeah, I, I do occasionally meet people that, that don't make the connection. They're like, oh, oh you're know. the Shermer of Shermer's neck? Yeah. Yes, yes, absolutely, yeah. <laughs> it's the only thing <laughs> I'll be remembered for. <laughs> A century from now, it's like, oh, yeah, it's like, yeah. Who, who is Alzheimer? He's the guy who discovered <laughs> yeah. Alzheimer's. Oh, <laughs> it'll be like that. I'll be known for a medical well, to me, that happened, yeah, that was in 1983. In 82, you know, I slept too much. I slept like three hours the first two nights, and Lon didn't sleep at all. So I'm like, all of a sudden, I'm six hours behind just on the sleep rate. So in 83, I said, okay, I'm just going to see if I can go all the way with no sleep at all. And I'd read about this kid that uh, went like, uh, I don't know, like 10 days without sleep at a UCLA oh. sleep lab back in the 70s. I thought, all right. And I read about this guy. I'm like, all right, I, let's see if I can do this. And that's when I had the alien abduction experience. This was, I rode from the Santa Monica Pier all the way into Hagler, Nebraska. And wow. it was like 1,280 miles without stopping. And, oh uh, and I was just wiped out. I'm just like, apparently just rolling down the road at like five miles an hour. And the crew pulls up to, to tell me, you know, it's time for a break. It's just not yeah. working out. And that's when I thought, okay, this is, these are aliens. You know, it's this big bright ship with the bright light pulling me over. And that, and these are all my friends and family and girlfriend and so yeah. on. And, uh, and, but they transmogrified right there on the side of the road to aliens that had shape shifted or body snatchers, whatever, taken oh, wow. over the bodies of my crew. But, and, and I knew that they were this, but I knew that they didn't know that I knew. So I'm playing along with their, their dialogue to get me into the motor. Home. Oh yeah, sure. And I'm quizzing my mechanic about the kind of glue he used for the sew-up tires on my rims. And I'm quizzing my girlfriend about personal, intimate details. And the aliens knew the answers. I'm like, wow, these aliens are so good. Anyway, it's a funny story because then they put me to sleep. And, you know, three hours later, I'm like, oh, that was funny. Yeah. And then you can actually watch, if you if you Google on YouTube, Shermer, yeah. comma, alien abduction, you'll see me riding across the Mississippi uh, River the next night. And Eric Hyden is uh, in the in the camera crew for ABC sports. He's like, how's it going? I go, not so good. <laughs> Last night yeah. I was abducted by aliens. He's like, what? <laughs> so I told him the whole story. Yeah. And so you, yeah. can, you can watch that. I didn't make that yeah. up, but you know, and I've always used that as an example of people that have personal experiences like that. The experiences yes. are quite real. They're not, you don't perceive them up here because you don't perceive your brain doing anything. Right. So the schizophrenic, they hear his voices. The voices are for them out there. Right. Yeah. Right. You know, right. So those are very uh, powerful experiences. Anyway, it turns out you can't go 10 straight days without sleep. That's, wow, wow that's insane. Wow. <laughs> then that was possible. Yeah. And then, and then, yeah, after that is when I got the Shermer neck thing, because th yeah. that's the year we had to go all the way up to Lon Haldeman's hometown um, in, uh, in, in Illinois. Um, uh, I forget the name of his town. No, sorry, Lon. Uh, anyway, so that added like an extra 200 miles to the race. And, uh -oh. uh, and I was just, yeah, and I was just like you said, it was, I, I just got up and started riding and went boom. And I'm like, what yeah. is this? I know. And we didn't know, no one knew what this was or, you know, hey, we could have a harness. We, I don't have any hair to braid, you know, so it's like, oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> so I ended up dropping out at the Ohio border. Yeah. You know, had I known that this is a common thing, I could have made preparations or said, okay, let's right. do the belt and the loop right. and the this yeah. and that. And I yeah. see a lot of the Ram riders doing that now. They do finish anyway. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I start the race before, so I don't even give it a chance. But since then, I also do a lot of neck strength exercises. I know that oh, is, right. it is a nerve condition that is hard, but it does help. Right. But like I said, I mean, I already start the race already braided and I'm all set to go. So we don't have to waste time halfway or a quarter of the way in to start, you know, thinking of apparatuses. But that's so far, it's been very successful for me. And that, but that does require a lot of hair. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah. So, OK, let's talk about the difference between motivation and discipline. I heard an interesting twist on this recently. This might have been from Jocko Wilnick. I don't know if you know Jocko. He's the 
ex Navy SEAL that uh, does a lot of motivation oh, speaking and all yeah. that. You've probably seen him. He's uh, he's he's quite insp- inspirational. Uh, but one of his things was, you know, just just do it, not in the Nike sense, but like, right. um, you know, if you set your alarm at, at 4 a.m. like he does, and he posts on right. Twitter his, his little watch, at 4.30, right. get up, it's time to work out. Right. You know, and so he makes the point that if you're, if you're trying to wait to be motivated, like I got to be motivated to do this, you're not going to do it. Mm. Discipline, he said, mm-hmm. you, you just do it. That's it. You're going to do it. I don't care if you're motivated or not. You're just going right. to do it. Right. How do you think about motivation and discipline? Well, I think when, you, when you're disciplined and you're organized, you see results. And that result is what gives you motivation to continue, right? So as long as you're structured, I think I think that's what uh, that that's kind of in the direction that he's going with. But that's what I say, right? Like the, take these little baby steps. When you see the progression, that progression is what. Wow, you know, if I do, you know, ten minutes of this, I dedicate my, you know, my time ten minutes. What about if I do twenty minutes? What if I do thirty? What about if I do forty minutes? Right. So you see that it does take work, you know, to do anything. But I think you can't be motivated before you have the discipline, because the discipline is what causes you to have the motivation, you know, to do your things. And to do whatever it might be. Yeah, that, that's called small wins, right? It's that, like yeah. that, that uh, retired admiral that gave that um, commencement speech that went viral where he said, you know, make your bed every morning. Yes. Like, what? Yes. <laughs> yeah. Makes sense, though. It does. You know, you know, you see it in the big picture that way, for sure. But like I said, I think um, is having a plan, though. It's not just saying it. A lot of times, you know, if you're saying the same things for the last 10 years and you just have to stop saying it. You know, that's what I think. So I think a lot of times we're good at, you know, of, of imagining things, but like not really doing the things, right? So it's like a dog that barks and doesn't bite. You want to bite and then you start barking, right? <laughs> you go, yay, to talk about whatever you've done, right? But I think a lot of us, you know, we just we just say things because it's for the sake of saying it, right? But it really doesn't mean anything when you're still saying something, the same things 10 years later that people stop listening. Okay. So, but what do you do when you hit a low spot? Like you're supposed to get up tomorrow morning and ride your rollers because it's cold in Canada. You should move to Southern California. (laughs) But short of that, you know, you get up tomorrow and like, oh, fuck, I really don't want to do this. How do you get yourself to do it? I mean, well, for me, it's just like, 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 how badly do I want? So I, do I want to come to that line prepared or not prepared? Things aren't always going to be perfect. I'm not going to wake up every morning, yay, motivation, yeah, I want to get on that bike and train, right? But I know that I have to. If I want to be happy in that race, if I want to have the results that I want to see at that finish line, then I have to do the work no matter what it takes. And that's the first thing I think about, right, is people that are also training for this, they're on their bike right now, and I'm not on their bike. That's enough for me to get me on the bike, right? But I think, you know, I think that's the, the points that make you the tough office is when you're really, really hurting, but you push yourself or when you really don't want to and you push yourself. That's the real training. That's what makes you tired, right? You know, same when, you know, when you're doing a four hour training ride, you're not getting benefits in the first two hours. It's the last two hours where you're really getting the benefits. Mm. Yeah. Lance used to tell a funny story about training here in, in Santa Barbara area in January with the postal guys. And then he would call uh, Jan Ulrich in Germany where it's snowing. Right. <laughs> He's like, guess what I'm doing? Yeah. I'm out here riding my bike and it's sunny and nice. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Well, true. I mean, look, look, I'm doing Transamerica. It's, it's freaking cold out here. It's like snowing right now. Two days ago, I rode in the snow, you know, for two and a half hours, but I go, oh. you know what, this could happen to me, you know, going through Colorado or McKenzie pass, you know, in Oregon. Right. So you have to think about putting yourselves in those kind of situations. Right. I don't like riding in this freaking cold outside but it's going to be beneficial for me when i'm faced with it it won't be that bad right you know so mm. i think it's you know facing those tough times and doing things that make you super uncomfortable because sometimes you have to learn to be comfortable being uncomfortable mm. and you do you get used to it or you just it's a, it's a matter of well I, I know what this is like and i did it before so i know i could do it again even if it's just as uncomfortable well, you have to get used to it or, you know, and just make the best of it. And, you know, you find like for me, it's it's proper clothing. You know what I mean? Is knowing because mm. for me, I don't like getting cold. Right. So you figure it out. But I don't want any surprises during the race. So it's better that I do it now. And I actually I train harder than I would in my race. And, I, you know, you know, so I make it I like the uncomfortable situations because it really prepares you for when the real situation, the real race, or whatever you're doing happens. Right. You know exactly what you need to do. OK. What's your diet like? Tell us about diet and nutrition well i'm vegan so i'm not very excited you are there. <laughs> okay <laughs> you know, why are so, you vegan uh, why am i vegan for health reasons or moral reasons or um, everything 
I think uh, it's yeah. I think it's more for for moral reasons for for me personally. Um, I mean, I don't go out there and promote whatever teach you. If you're like happy, you know, with the hamburger, good for you, right? So it's just a personal choice that I I am really connected to animals. I love animals, and for me, it just doesn't feel right. You know, um, so, like I said, it's a personal choice. Um, and and I feel good on the diet. That I eat a lot of fruits and vegetables, a lot of salads. You know, um, I'm not a, a big eater. I don't sit down for big meals. I'm more grazing because of you know, as you know, ultra endurance racing. You're eating on the bike constantly, right? You know, so yeah. So that's just kind of my my lifestyle. I'm not big on sweets. You know, like cake and chocolate and can never have been right. So, but I do on the occasion. I think everything with balance is the key. Mm-hmm. Beer and wine. I don't drink. I told you I'm boring. <laughs> <laughs> okay, you're going to do Trans America. What's the, that? That's essentially Ram unsupported. You're on your own. You have to carry yeah. everything. You're on your own. Yeah, it's a little bit. It's a different. It starts in Astoria, Oregon, and ends in Yorktown, Virginia. So oh. it's a little longer. It's 4,200 miles, and like I said, you can't have any help. So, you know, I'm having the bike built now. Um, you know, to have a bike with all you know you got to carry everything with you right so but you can't carry enough water and food for the, all those well you're uh, gonna have days. to use gas stations and yeah. <laughs> creeks and whatever so we'll see i mean it's been done right but i think i mean i ram will always be my favorite always be you know and i'm, and I'm not done with ram but i think just a, a new challenge you know something like that is um it's just exciting to me i think just to, to do something a little bit out of my comfort zone again um probably make me a lot tougher though when i do go back to ram <laughs> yeah i would say but how does a vegan do that on the road? I mean, there's not, I mean, there's McDonald's well, everywhere, but that's not going to help. <laughs> gonna, well, it's going to be tricky for sure. I mean, like a lot of nuts, dried nuts and granola bars or whatever, you know what I mean? Who knows? Oh, well, 7 Eleven has stuff like that. <laughs> yeah. Know. Like maybe I'll be a meat eater at the end of this race. Who knows, right? <laughs> I used to stop at Dairy Queens. I would like the Dairy Queen, get a blizzard. Yeah. <laughs> you probably exactly. don't have that. That's too much sugar. <laughs> yeah. And so you might do Ram again. Oh, not like my, I will, for sure. You will, Absolutely. okay. Yes, yes. Did you want to break your, your personal record or go for well, Shauna's yeah, record? Yeah, I just, I love the race. Like I said, it's always been my favorite race. I love it and fascinated with it. And yeah, and I love the Ram family. What is Shauna's record? I forget. Is it like nine days, two hours or something like that? I think so, Pretty yeah. I think, but I think her record, there's not only a bit of shorter course to a different course. Things they started more up north, so she didn't go through the desert. But it's an incredibly fast time. I believe it's nine days, like I said, something, something, close to nine days and some. Yeah. No, see, let me see, think. That's when we were leaving. That's when I was race director. We left from Irvine, California, mm -hmm. and we went out. Uh, let's see. No, we went north over through Colorado. That's right. We right. didn't go straight across the desert. Quite, quite. Although you can't avoid the desert at some level. Right. Um, yeah, it was interesting being race director as opposed to a racer. I did a race on, on the bike five times and then race director 15 times. So I wow. 20 times across the country. So I've seen every corn silo there is. Right. <laughs> <laughs> I have no yeah. desire to go across anymore, but, no? <laughs> uh, but it was an interesting experience. Um, I've seen all the other, the riders going through the stuff I went through and went, oh, yeah. this is normal. The hallucinations yeah. and, the, so you can relate. and the delays and the this and that. Yeah, it was, it was, it was pretty interesting. I wrote about some of that because in the Believing Brain about hallucinations, because yeah. pretty much everybody has some sleep de deprived hallucinations oh, of some kind. Yes. What, what, what are some of the weirder ones you, you experienced? Oh my gosh. I mean, I had a black leopard leap at me and I remember veering to the other side of the road, you know? You did? <laughs> yeah, it was, I'm doing this, whatever, and I saw, like, uh, graffiti on the on the ground, like, you know, like, the like Greek, you know, um, pictures, and I was, yes. and the, the big boulders turned kind of, they're moving, you know what I mean? Just, yeah, but the thing is, I know I'm hallucinating, right, you know, and I'm looking at something and then it starts to get clear as you come up to it, right, you know? Um, but actually it's gotten better as the more experienced I am, because I mm. know that I can't look around. I just have to focus in one direction, just on the road. And then I find that the hallucinations, they're, they're more controlled. Whereas if oh, you start looking around, you just start seeing, because everything will be something that it's right. not. You know? Right. Oh, interesting. Yeah. All right. How do you balance personal life? I don't know anything about you, married or whatever, kids, I don't know, uh, with everything, all the training, you know, people go, oh, well, she could do that, but I, I have a job and I have this and that. You know, how do you, what, what do you say to somebody that, you know, well, find I mean, that I balance? Well, I kind of set myself up. I mean, I am divorced. I was married. I'm divorced. Um, I, I'm a real estate investor, so I have the time to, you know, to train. But I think, you know, even if you just did one event, you know, uh, a year that, you know, then 
mind you too, I'm not obsessed with the bike. Like I love my off season because I can do other things. I'm very close to nature. I have two dogs that I love to hike. I've got great friends, you know, so I love my cycling season, but I also like it when I'm not cycling too. So I think having mm. balance is really important and it makes you more motivated. So I'm more hungry to train and I want to race and do well, but then I'm really happy when it's over, you know, because I've done all that hard work. I've had hopefully a good result and then I'm ready to move on to something else. Oh, that's an interesting way to think about it because here in Santa Barbara, there's really no excuse really ever to not be out on the bike. Right. <laughs> Sometimes when it, when it rains, I'm like, thank God, <laughs> I can take a break and I, and I don't have to feel guilty. And I know no one else is riding either. It's like, then I'm doubly relieved. <laughs> that's hilarious. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's a good thing you're not around here when you're trying, you never ride here because it rains all the no, time. I'm, I'm a total wimp. <laughs> Especially yeah. in Vancouver. And I resisted joining Strava. Uh, and, and then I got into, it. I thought, oh, this is great. But now I constantly check it to see what the other guys are doing. It's like, oh yeah. no, I yeah. got to get out there. <laughs> yeah, Look how far he is. went. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> I don't know if that's good or not. It's that, that comparison thing of social right. media. Well, it's fun maybe competition, not, right? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Okay. So you're roughly speaking a baby boomer, or maybe a late baby boomer, or early, whatever the next one is. Millennium? Millennial? I don't know. I'm not sure. Um, <laughs> But, you know, there's issues now with, you know, kids these days, this generate the iGen generation, having problems with, um, you know, motivation, also depression, anxiety, all this stuff. There's lots of books about this now. Mm -hmm. You know, the rates of uh, depression, anxiety, suicidal ideation, cutting, anorexia, you know, and so forth. Mm -hmm. um, and the question is why, you know, so there's different theories about this, not as much outdoor time. Uh, mm -hmm. more c controlled play dates, a lot of screen time, not mm -hmm. interacting with other people under natural settings, but rather online or just by yourself playing some video games, something like that. There's also kind of the coddling. These kids have been yeah. coddled by parents, you know, basically mm -hmm. my generation yeah. coddling because we only had one, maybe two kids. And therefore you're very risk averse about the kids and what you let them do. So you, you know, helicopter parenting them. Mm -hmm. Then there's a whole safety culture. You know, lawyers basically design playgrounds so that no one yeah. can ever get hurt. Right. You know, and then, and then there's, you know, teachers becoming, you know, therapists. Like every child has some problem. I know. And we have to pathologize and call it something. Oh, you have ADHD or you have uh, this problem or that problem. We're going to get you the help you need. You're a victim of something. And that distills in these kids this sense of, you know, I, I, I can't do it myself. You know, I need my parents. I need the teacher. Okay. I need the... You know, so this constant, so one distinguished there is between a culture of honor and a culture of victimhood. So the culture of honor, you solve conflicts yourself. Yeah. You know, if there's a problem, you just take care of it. And you don't yeah. go to your parents, you don't go to your teacher, totally. you don't go to yeah. the administration. You just take care of it with the people you're dealing with. Yeah. And the culture of victimhood status, no, 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 you can't handle it. Right. So anyway, there's a bunch of books about, it, about that. It remains to be seen how this is going to play out, you know, to what yeah. extent is the should the government regulate social media? Uh, should parents be putting restrictions on screen time or which apps kids are allowed to use? Should they even have a, a smartphone until they're maybe 17 or something like that? Or you can have a flip phone. The point is get off the apps, get outside and do something. Anyway, yeah. do you have any thoughts on all that? Well, I mean, for sure. I mean, it's it's a sh sad state. Let's wait. I remember just going, to, like I was walking in Vancouver with my sister at the bus station. There was about, I don't know, 10 people waiting for the bus and every single one of them was on their phone. Kids are on their phone constantly, right? And I think that has a big part of it, right? We are just so glued to technology, to FaceTime, to Facebook, to whatever. Like it's just, and I mean, do you remember when we were, when I was a kid, like I said, I used to have to go outside and play till it got dark. And then I knew I had to come back in, but it was being more creative that I had to, we had to make games on our own and think about things and being outdoor, being out in nature, you know, having that more of that human connection than there is now. And I think that does a big part of it. And I think now this is, I'm like I said, I'm not a psychologist. I just, from my own personal observation or whatever. And I just think, like you said, we do, we 
completely coddle our kids. And that's why I think in Israel, I think they have it right when they when you have to go to the military, when you finish high school, they go in as this punky young kid and they come out as a young, strong, you know, adult, really independent, you know. So I think in that respect, the military is really, really good for young kids, kind of to give them direction. And also military helps you find what you're good at. And it shows you that, you know, with hard work, you can be good at almost anything when you put your mind to it. So I think that's kind of, you know, I mean, that might be old school thinking, but I think the direction is these kids that just can do basically whatever they want. I have a good friend, my training partner, he was a teacher. He quit his job because we can't do it anymore because he goes, I'm going to get sued or whatever. You can't discipline the kids anymore. It's like going into a zoo, you know, and he's transitioned from being a teacher, never go back into that profession again. So I feel when I was a kid, it was, hello, Mrs. You know, Sapinski, Mr. Smith or whatever discipline. We were almost afraid of our teachers, right? But there's a sign of respect there and there should be. And it gives more order, you know, and teaches you to be respectful and independent and a strong adult, right? But that's all gone to the toilet. I mean, like I said, I'm not a psychologist. I don't know, but I just know that our generation was a lot more personal than it is now. Yeah, I think that's right. I think all of that is Part of it, if you don't have, I actually like that idea of the required military, although then in America, I'm not sure that would ever happen because well, that I would know. Be something like <laughs> the, the draft not. and the We're draft would never. Yeah. But, I mean, but if you don't have that sports, I always think, well, I did mm -hmm. at my age, when I was in high school, it was the end of the Vietnam War and nobody wanted to go in the military. This was like a, the most disgraceful thing you could do. Right. And, you know, it's very different now, but. So, but I got into sports. It was really sports to say, but the point is to have structure and yes. goals yes. and get up and get out there and do something every yes. day. Absolutely. You know, it could be arts, it could be music, anything, entertainment. Like I say, it doesn't have to be sports, but I think when a, when a young person has a discipline, you know, whatever it may be, they're focused on that and they don't have time to mess around or screw around with kids or, and you know, when you're, you have too much time on your hand, you're thinking of bad things, right? You know? <laughs> right. So I just think is having that discipline in something, finding that something that, you know, that, that triggers you, that lights your fire is really important. And that's why, you know, when we were growing up, my mother, you know, let us do everything. I did guitar, drum lessons, soccer, baseball, you name it. I did the same with my sister, right? Then I found, okay, this is what I really like to do. But she enrolled us with anything that possible. Like in the community centers, we did it, right? Because it was fun. And then you find, okay, this is my niche. This is what I really love. And you hang on to it. And I think it's really important for to do that at a really young age, you know, and it teaches you, teaches a young kid, you know, discipline is what makes you successful, what gets you results. Yeah, for sure. Yeah, I like that idea of parent uh, is good parenting is just get your kid to try a lot of different things and see what yeah. they like, see what they're good Absolutely. at. Absolutely. I know for sure I'm not a musician. Right? No, <laughs> I can't sing with my life yeah. dependent on it, right? That I found out early, right? But I was kind of good in sports, you know? So that's the direction yeah, I Yeah, so I mean, the title of your memoir is What No Limits, right? Yes, no limits. But of course, there are limits. You just gave one. You're, you, right. you have limits on your musical abilities. Okay, right. but that's not the point. The point is find the ones you are good at and yes. then pursue those. Exactly. Reach for the stars. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Yeah, I think of it this way that, you know, probably most things we try, we're not going to be good at, right? Maybe there's, you try a hundred, maybe there's 10 that you could succeed at. Okay, well then pick one of those. Right, and go exactly. for that, right? Yeah. You know, that's kind of more of a strategic thing. I've been you know, fascinated. Let me, yeah, go let ahead. me just go back on that though. Like, yeah. like when I left Israel to do, go into cycling, I mean, I really loved it, but I wasn't very good at it. But it took me eight years. Then I was really good at it, right? You know what I mean? So even if you do find something that you're not like, and you know, you know, you don't need a a, a gift to be you know talented in anything you know that you choose to do. There's a gift called that we all have, and it's called the gift of work. And once mm. you use that gift, believe believe you me, you can almost make anything happen, even if you're not good at it. And I just use my cycling, not not the endurance cycling, the pro racing kind of the earlier years that it did. It took me eight years to finally get to that point, that level of racing that I was dreaming about. But it was a lot of hard work. It was a lot of embarrassment, you know. I mean, listen, I would go into these races, these pro races, and I'd come in so last that I wouldn't even know where the finish line was. I'd see my <laughs> car in an empty parking lot and go, okay, yeah, this must be it. <laughs> That's that was the extent oh, of boy. how bad I was as a pro racer. <laughs> okay. Really and it didn't happen once or twice. It was a couple a couple of hands, you know what I mean? But you know what? I was uh, I refused to quit. And then I finally, you know, I just said, This is it, man. I had this one insult from a race director saying that I was worth you know, I couldn't find more shit or something. That following season, man, I came back and I was conquering mountains, breaking records, you name it. I was done with this insult and the embarrassment, right? I mean, that happened at age 38 years old. 
38. Wow. Yeah, yeah. 38, man. It took me a long time. <laughs> so even yeah, if that's... you're not pretty good at it, but you really love it, there's still a way. There's yeah. still hope. <laughs> you know, that is an interesting phenomenon I've been noticing. Tom Brady, LeBron James, these guys going into their 40s at the top level. Yeah. Which, you know, 40, that would have been, you, you'd have been retired for almost a decade uh, for yeah. athletes my age. Right. Astonishing. So that's improved nutrition, training, understanding the body, that kind of yeah. stuff. Not stressing about stupid things, you know, which are super important, right? Um, in your environment, who you had decide to hang out with your friends, you know. Um, and just remember, like, life is short and you have to enjoy it as much as you can, right? It's, it's precious. Yeah, I've read that uh, Brady and LeBron James um, and Novak Djokovic, they have entire teams. They, they call them physios, right? You got your nutritionist and the massage therapist and, you know, all the trainers and coaches and all this stuff, the whole team around. And you just kind of keep going. The idea is we're just going to go all year, next year, the next year, sort of pacing yourself on mm -hmm. diet and stretching and all this stuff. You know, I don't think athletes really did that back in the 60s and 70s. No, no. I mean, yeah, I mean, I never... This, this, especially as you say, as we age, like strength stuff and stretching, super important, right? You know, because you got to think of the long term effects of whatever you're doing, too. Like, how is this going to affect you in 10 years and five years or whatever? Because you don't want to be, you know, 80 years old sitting on, you know, in a wheelchair or whatever, can't move, right? You should be able as limber <laughs> right. as you were when you're 20. Is just keep that proper lifestyle, you know, with good nutrition and, you know, sports and whatever exercise. So do you do things like yoga and stretching or I don't know what? I do. I don't like it. I have to admit, but I yeah. do. I'm not very good at it. It's not a pretty scene, but I do it. <laughs> I find that it really helps me. Downward do dog. Like oh no. <laughs> <laughs> I, do. I find, especially with the stretching and stuff, right? It's just the mobility, right? Just being able to move and be more flexible because you lose that. And same with strength as you get older, right? So I think that's almost more important than the endurance part. So I do incorporate that into my daily activity. Even when I'm not racing for something, I still do that kind of a really pathetic routine every evening. So <laughs> <laughs> That's funny. I tried Bikram yoga for a while. That's oh, that really? hothouse yoga. Hot yoga, yeah. Oh my God, it was horrible. Yeah. I mean, because it's basically sweat control. I mean, I have like two yeah. thick towels underneath me and it yeah. was still embarrassing but yeah. i you know i naturally sweat a lot i mean i was sweating like donald trump in church with stormy daniels i mean it was bad i was sweating like a like a gender studies professor trying to answer the question what is a woman okay <laughs> now i've offended everybody all right now these are lame jokes i've told on twitter <laughs> um but yeah that you know to me the indoor stuff is difficult because you know i have the, the kind of the sweat control part um, and, but for, for me, just being outdoors, I like hiking, walking, just yep. get out there. I like kind of scenery going by sun, wind. Yep. I don't know. There's something about that to me Absolutely. versus being in, in a gym. Yeah. It's therapeutic almost too. Like I enjoy my hikes when I'm kind of by myself with my dogs. It's just, you kind of clear your mind, you, you know, rejuvenate yourself, kind of recharge the battery. I think it's important. You ever listen to audio content? I don't. I don't. You don't. Yeah. I, don't. I recommend it. If you're by yourself, yeah, I mean, okay. if you need to concentrate on something. When I ride with the guys, I don't listen with yeah. the, to anything. Um, I don't want to crash or whatever we're talking or whatnot. Yeah. There is something also the social, you kind of the social aspects of sports being, you know, with your friends, your training partners or whatever. Yeah. That's like a, a third, you know, there's just like three areas of your life, your personal home life, then your work life with your workmates. And then everybody needs a third space. Yeah. You know, it could be your church or it could be your the, the volunteer mm -hmm. place or your your hobby or your sports or whatever that or the gym, something. Just go somewhere where it's not work and it's not home. Yeah, exactly. It's more for personal, for your own personal, like and just for you. You know, I think it's important to have that, to disconnect from everything else and just do something that, you know, you just feel like you're grounded. Yeah, I got that from a guy named Bruce Hood. He's a cognitive psychologist at, at Bristol in the UK and his new book is called the science of happiness. And it turns out there's research showing that having that third place to go yeah. seems to be really fulfilling to people. Yeah. And, and of yes. course I, I've never liked the word happiness because you know, it's most of what you do that brings fulfillment and meaningful and purpose in your life right. doesn't make you happy necessarily at the, at the time you're doing it. You know, so maybe that's right. not just, you know, self-satisfaction or well-being or, you know, just yeah. flourishing, whatever the right word is. But again, having those three different places is part of it. Having goals. I've been following the, uh, the um, career of your, your, your Canadian mate there, uh, Jordan Peterson. 
the psychologist. You've probably heard of him. <laughs> and, uh, you know, one of his messages is really basic stuff that pretty much everything we've been talking about, you know, just, you know, get your life in order, have goals, make your bed, work out, eat well, you oh. know, and, and be thoughtful and respectful to other people. They may know something you don't know. And so yeah. I remember the totally. first time I was reading this and hearing this going, you know, the thousands of people in this auditorium are like, they've never heard this. And it's like, didn't anyone walk you through this when you were growing oh, up? I mean, this right, is pretty basic right. stuff. But I think maybe th with this generation, they, they're not getting this. Yeah. And it's never too, you know, old, you're never too old to start, right? Even if you are in your 70s or 60s or whatever it may be, I think if you just have the balance is really important, right? It'll just, it'll, it'll completely shift how you feel. Make you feel a heck of a lot better. So I think it's important. Yeah. Right. All right. So here we are in March. You're still in the snow. <laughs> I, well, yes. When it, Crazy. When is your Trans America? That's in June. It's in June. <laughs> so it's so now, will you go somewhere to train for that? Where it's no, warmer to get yeah, the miles? No, he's actually. I'm. I'm working with the coach, and he just said because of the conditions, I'll be facing it. You know, because I do. Mind you, I do train a lot in Vancouver. My parents live there, which is five hours into the west from where I live. So I've been training there a lot in the rain just to get used to those elements. You know, I know what it's like to, to train in the nice stuff. So I mean, it's still rideable. I just have to ride like a mountain bike or a cross bike with heavy, you know, fatter tires to just for safety reasons. Yeah. So what's a typical day look like? What'd you do today? Um, well, today, actually, I'm I'm just coming on. Yesterday, I did a 17-hour ride, right? You know, I'm just coming off oh. a 45-hour week. So. You did 17 hours? Yeah, I did. <laughs> I can't believe I used to do that. I just can't even. I don't even know who that person is that did that. <laughs> no. Well, you don't, you don't even think. I can't look at the clock or the time because of that, no. and, you know, that'll take forever. So you just get it. It's part of the training. You get used to it, right? You know, go, yeah, you only got 10 more hours to go, right? So it's a different mindset for sure. Yeah. Okay, and you said you're 55? Yes, I'm 55, correct. Okay, so what's the, the next five years and the next 10 years look like? What, what well, are your big I mean, goals? We, um, I have a documentary that's being picked up by GRB Entertainment. Well, we have a contract with them just in review right now. So kind of focusing on that, possibly another um, publishing company to get a second book made because a lot has happened since that book has been published. Um, and I'm still on the speaking circuit and I love it, right? And I, again, I'll still continue to race. So I'm... Enjoying life as much as I can. Now, in your, when, when you give a speech, what is it that you say that resonates with people? What do they want to hear? Well, I think it's mostly talking about my life experience. I mean, again, mind you, it depends who I'm speaking to, right? You know, I mean, I speak to many different platforms, many different audiences, right? So they mostly want to hear kind of the struggles that I went through, kind of hitting rock bottom, you know, getting to the top and some of the crazy. I mean, Race Across America is fascinating for people. They just love the story in itself, right? It's actually <laughs> one of the most popular part of my presentation is Race Across America. They just, huh. because they have no idea about what goes through the, you know, what you have to do to get there, the mindset, you know, getting the crew, the, the drama of the crew, the whole experience is, is just amazing and people love it. So, you know, that's what I talk about to, to motivate and to inspire and hope people will start doing things that they've been put on on hold for so many years. Well, that was another interesting part of being a race director is to see the crews. Because I yeah. never saw the, uh, other people's crews when I was riding. Yeah. And I had no idea how many, you know, weird meltdowns and personality conflicts oh and Totally. And every year somebody would be left on the side of the road somewhere. <laughs> yeah. I mean, one of my crew members took off this year, right? He just got out of the car, crossed the highway, and we never saw him again. Really? <laughs> yeah. I mean, Did I didn't know was somebody? Racer, right? They didn't tell me till I figured it out kind of, you know, in day six or something. <laughs> like, well, we're missing a person, right? You know, there's a lot of drama. You know what? I'm happy to be out in the road just riding my bike and not have to deal with what's going on back there, right? You know? So that's yeah, because the crew gets, uh, <laughs> they get, for, for those listening that don't know, it's a nonstop race. So although you may be sleeping and stopping occasionally, the crew has to, they're just always going. Always you fun. need a good crew captain that makes people sleep because if they are sleep deprived, that really uh, causes things to fall apart. Yes, absolutely. <clears throat> we, I remember it was one racer, I, I won't give any names, but he, he, he had on his crew, his wife and his mistress. <laughs> Oh my God. <laughs> so we figured this out. We And then we were kind of placing bets w when the whole thing was going to fall apart. And sure enough, like day six, it's like, oh, he's DNF. Gee, I wonder what happened. Oh my gosh. <laughs> yeah. Can't do that. <laughs> yeah. The wife found out, figured out what was going on or something like that. Yeah. And others, yeah, the crews were falling apart and inevitably yeah. somebody would be sent home in the middle of the country. 
Yeah. Uh, in 80, in 18, 1989, we had the very first team ramp that uh, we started, which was the human powered vehicle. So there's just four teams. Mm -hmm. Each of us had a, one of those slipstream, you know, vehicles that human powered vehicles in which the, you are riding, you know, supine. Um, and, and so we were, my team was, uh, on the gold rush. The gold rush was the world's fastest bike at the time. Oh, wow. uh, fast Freddie Markham road broke the record. 66 miles an hour on the Bonneville salt flats on the gold rush. So we thought, okay, we're going to ride the gold rush across America, the four of us, but it was a modified version because, um, basically you're just strapped into this thing and you just go and then they catch you at the finish line. So you, so you don't fall over. Wow. So we had to make a modified one with a double gear reduction system. So you had two sets of chain rings and because the, you know, um, the, the gold rush is just on flats, right? So this, you have these huge mountains across the country. So, you know, you could go from, 60, 70 miles an hour to, you know, three miles an hour up some hill. And then we had a little tiny windshield cut there so you can get some air because it was so hot inside this thing. And it's, it's made out of, you know, kind of a fiberglass kind of right. material. And it's, you know, you're, so you're just like tucked into this thing and the walls are right up against your shoulders and you're riding, you know, like this. And uh, you can only last about, you can only last about 15, 20 minutes inside the thing. And then you'd have to, you know, switch. But the switch thing, you know, there was like a zipper door. So you had to like roll up and put your, and he cut a hole in the bottom. So you put your foot down through this, this like kind of rubber sheet and put your foot on the ground so you don't fall over. And so this is quite the ordeal. We only had one bike. Oh, and the other teams had two bikes so they could swap back and forth and keep the rotation. Right. So we, but our bike was better than the other bikes and we had really good racers. So we led most of the way across and. I remember the first time we got out to Palm Desert, we had to turn left on that. I think it was Highway 39 or 69 or whatever it is. So just before you get into Palm Springs, you go left and up into the upper desert. And so you have that tailwind going through the desert. It's like 40 right. mile an hour tailwind. So mm -hmm. I'm just, and it's my pole. So I'm going like 70 miles an hour on the interstate there. Unbelievable. And then it's like, <laughs> oh, you got to get off here and go left. So I get off and I go left. And all of a sudden the, the wind hits the, oh the side of the bike. And, and I just go, bam, right into the curb. Bam, down the embankment, and I'm just oh, lying God. on my side on the <laughs> zipper door, and it's you know, 120 degrees outside. And I'm like, oh, God, I could die. And then the crew comes up, and they get me out of there. And then Fast yeah. Freddy Markham jumps in, and he goes, give me that thing. And he rode it up like a wing, like this, all the way up the hill. <laughs> it was unbelievable. And then, yeah. uh, but then things started going wrong. I mean, we were just um, had mechanical problems, and yeah. whenever there was a mechanical problem, we had to just stop and sit there and work on the bike. You know, yeah. Gardner Martin, Gardner Martin was the name of the guy who invented the gold rush. He's dead now. Anyway. So, uh, he, he would fix it and then we go again and then stop and go again and stop. And the other guys are starting to catch up with us, you know, as we get halfway across three quarters, we're in Ohio and then we got pulled over one night and the police are like, what is this thing? It's a bicycle. This is not a bicycle. It's like, yeah, look, it has a front light and a tail light. And it's got pedals and it's got a chain. I don't know. Let me look at this thing, you know, 20 minutes later. Okay. You can go, you know, it's one thing after another and we get lost and yeah. then our crew wasn't sleeping. We're down to four people. And then all the way into New Jersey, uh, one of the four guys, oh, and we had four riders, but one guy got heat stroke the first day. So we were down to three riders for like the, in the middle of the country for like a thousand miles. Anyway, I'm just, <laughs> you're not going to believe this, this ending. So, uh, one of the guys gets on the freeway, but it was the wrong road. And all of a sudden he's like on this interstate, he wasn't supposed to be there. And there's like 18 wheelers blowing by and the little vans following him. Like, Oh my God, he's trying to get off. And, and he finally gets off the road and we turn down this little side road and we're just completely shaken. Like he could have just been killed. And Gardner Martin, the head of the whole thing goes, that's it. We're done. He takes the bike, he puts it in his truck and he drove off. And the three of us are sitting there, four of us are sitting there on the side of the road going, well, what do we do? We don't have a bike. <laughs> and that was the end of the ro road for us. We oh, DNF it in New Jersey. <laughs> we drove in to New York to greet the, the team that won, <laughs> which was Pete Pensier's team. Wow. Unbelievable. Yeah, it's, it's so it was so frustrating. Sure. Just, it was, everybody's wiped out, sleep deprived. Yeah. wasted yeah that was yes. that, that was yes. probably the worst that was worse than the Shermanek year i think uh <laughs> just because just so frustrating yeah you know so how do you Absolutely. deal with failure like that just you know when everything falls apart yeah it yeah, is, a, it is a huge challenge for sure finding the the right combination of people that have the right chemistry like i said they're they're hungry they're sleep deprived they're frustrated 
So it is, it's really, it's, that's part of Ram. Like it, that's why the logistics, I mean, we're, we, we work on it a year out from the race to get the right combination of people. We do practice races to see if they can jive, you know, because if you can't handle somebody for two, three days, then imagine 10 days on the road with someone, right? So <laughs> it is, it's a, it's, it's, sometimes it can be quite a nightmare is finding the, the right combination of people. I almost yeah. find that more difficult than the training for Race Cross America. Yeah. Yeah. The other interesting thing about being race track was the rules. And how I, I could see what the riders were doing to try to gain just a little advantage. For example, if you're riding down the road and there's a crosswind, we started to notice that the, the van would pull up next to the rider and have like a 15 minute water bottle handoff in yeah. chat. You know, it's exactly, like, wait a right? minute, <laughs> what's going on here? Oh, there's a crosswind. Oh, I see. So we yeah. had to implement rules about that unless yeah. it was too hot, in which case you come. It, it, I think we had the rule was you could only come up like once every 15 minutes. Right. Right. And, and unless it's 120, then you can come up every 10 minutes. You know, we had all these crazy right. rules. And then another year, um, the state of Arizona said you can't follow the cyclist behind them. Oh. Uh, they have to just leapfrog the whole leapfrog. way across the state. And it was like, well, this is dangerous. Uh, yeah. it, it, we can't allow this at night. So we had to have, the, they compromised, said, okay, you could do it, at, follow them at night. So then we had to have a rule when night begins. <laughs> right. Okay, at 6 o'clock, you can pull up behind your rider. Yeah. And at 6 a.m., you have to get off, get out of there and leapfrog for the rest. Anyway, that was, right. that was crazy. Right. Well, they have that now. I think it's 7 to 7. 7 p.m. to 7 a.m., you have to have direct follow. And then you can do leapfrog. But there are certain areas that are considered a little bit more dangerous that there is a requirement of direct follow certain, you know, Arizona. That's right. When we were on the phone, I told you about Wayne Phillips, your fellow Canadian. In 18, 1985, he rode across solo, um, self-supported. He asked if he could do that, and the, and the organization let him. And he was hit by a uh, rider truck, paralyzed for life. And then oh I see he died a couple of years ago. Uh, yeah, it is dangerous. I, I hope you're going to be okay on that Transamerica. Well, yeah. Keep my fingers crossed. <laughs> yeah. I, I guess you can't think about that. You don't use one of those little mirrors or whatever to see who's coming behind I, you, do you? Maybe I should. I mean, I was considering it, but I don't normally do it. But yeah, I think I'd have to start training with that now. But um. yeah, I, I've I've seen some of the guys have on their the, the Garmin. They have a little beeper. It's like a radar thing in the yeah. back or something. It it detects cars coming up. Yeah, there's lots of stuff that you you know, precaution that you could use. That I think I have one of those. Um, yeah, we might come up with something, but definitely the mirror might be an idea for sure. Just because, like I said, I've never used one before, so yeah, um, might be worth it for your, <laughs> you know, for, obviously for safety reasons. Yeah. All right, Leah. Thank you so much for talking to us about all this stuff. What do you think is going to happen with all this craziness of anti-Semitism or anti-Zionism or the whole stuff of Israel? What are your thoughts about the future of going forward? I mean, on that? I mean, I think. Until the situation changes in Israel, I think it's only going to get worse, right? Especially if the mm -hmm. Israel starts, you know, more with the north of Hezbollah, then we're, it's just going to continue. Right? I think until things kind of simmer down and settle down or there is a, a negotiation for ceasefire, then I think, you know, it's still, it's, I don't think it's going to get any better anytime soon until the situation in Israel improves. Yeah. Yeah. I'm a big supporter of Israel. You absolutely have to defend yourself. But Netanyahu... Yeah. I don't know if he's got, he's the right leader, you yeah, know, this kind of relentless, um, uh, response. Oh boy. I mean, there's a lot of bad things going on. I, mean, like, I know. Come it, on, it, let's it find is. a it, solution. It's frustrating. I think for a lot of people, it is absolutely. Yeah. All right, Leah, go back training. All right. Thank you so much for having me. It was a pleasure to be. Oh, yeah. no, it's great. You were so interesting.